Hello, and welcome back to The Crime Reel. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the life of John Button. John was born on the 9th of February 1944 in Liverpool, England. He was the third child of Lillian and Charles Button, who already had a five-year-old daughter named Margaret and a three-year-old son named Peter. Three years after John's birth, their family was complete when they had another boy who they named Jimmy. Lillian and Charles were seen as older parents at the time, with the birth of their first child being when they were 31 and 40 respectively. Baby Jimmy was born when Lillian was 39 and Charles was 48. Charles was a hard-working man who built up a successful building business. This was in the post-war period, allowing the family to move to a large house in Tulse Hill, London. However, by 1954, Charles began to suffer with ill health and the family decided to move to a drier climate in Australia. Initially, only Charles made the journey to the other side of the world in order to get things organised for the family, leaving Lillian and the four children behind. Whilst the two oldest children, Margaret and Peter, were quite academic, John struggled at school, needing a great deal of attention and guidance. John developed a nervous twitch and a stutter and was bullied about these at school. He began to play truant and his mother, who was struggling to look after and support four children by herself, found it difficult to bring him into line. Originally, the family had planned that the two eldest children, Margaret and Peter, would be the first to join Charles in Australia. But, due to the problems which John was having, it was decided that he and Margaret should be the first to join their father. They arrived in Australia in 1958, seeing their father for the first time in over four years. Although missing his mother, John settled into his new life in Australia well and soon found a job. He was much happier and, with this new calmer lifestyle away from any bullying, his stutter and nerves all but disappeared. They only reappeared if he was particularly stressed. Eventually, Lillian, Peter and Jimmy also travelled to Australia and the family were reunited. John began working as a labourer for a bricklayer and when he was 18, he met a 17-year-old girl by the name of Rosemary Anderson. The pair soon started dating and John began making plans to propose to Rosemary on her 18th birthday. On the 9th of February 1963, John's 19th birthday, the young couple spent the day together. They enjoyed some time at Rosemary's house, having lunch with her parents, before driving to the beach and then returning to John's house in the evening. When they arrived home, John's parents, Charles and Lillian, were heading out for dinner as they had not been expecting John to return home until later that evening. John and Rosemary, along with John's younger brother Jimmy, spent the evening together at the house on Redfern Street. They played some cards and had fish and chips for their dinner. When they were eating, John noticed someone trying to take some of his dinner. Thinking that it was his brother Jimmy, John shouted, bloody leave it alone. However, it was actually Rosemary who had tried to take some of his food and she did not appreciate the tone in which he had spoken to her. An argument followed and Rosemary left the house and started to walk home. John went after her, apologised and asked her to get in the car so that he could drive her home. Rosemary refused and kept walking. Deciding to give Rosemary time to cool off, John lit a cigarette and watched her walk away. Rosemary walked out of sight through a dark railway underpass before turning left onto Stubbs Terrace. After a couple of minutes, John drove to catch up with Rosemary, hoping to once again apologise and then drive her home. However, when he turned the corner onto Stubbs Terrace, he saw Rosemary lying next to the road, unconscious and bleeding profusely. John was terrified. He picked Rosemary up and knowing that her doctor's surgery was nearby, he drove her straight there. The doctor called the emergency services, who arrived shortly afterwards. 
Rosemary was rushed to the hospital while the police stayed with John. Noticing the damage to the front left corner of John's car, a Simca Aronda, the police became suspicious of his version of events. John explained that he'd had a minor accident with a Ford Prefect a few weeks before and that he had not had the opportunity to get the damage repaired. When asked about the blood on and in his car, John said that it must have happened when he moved Rosemary into the car in order to get help. John was taken to the Central Police Station for further questioning. With the extreme stress of the situation, his stutter returned. The police saw this as a suspicious sign and continued to question him about the events for hours on end. It has been reported that John was not informed of his rights, was not allowed to contact anyone and was punched by one of the police officers during the interview. After around five hours of questioning, where John repeatedly told the police what had happened, he was informed that Rosemary had died from her injuries. Devastated and prepared to do anything to get away from the interrogation room, John agreed to sign a confession. The confession stated that he had seen Rosemary walking and he had hit her with his car, heard a loud crunch and had carried her a short distance on the front of his vehicle. He then stopped the car, got out, lifted Rosemary into the car and took her to the doctor's surgery. He believed that the police would soon work out what had actually happened and he would be released. But instead, he was charged with Rosemary's murder and sent to jail. He was held in isolation in a small cell containing only a mattress on the floor and a toilet bucket. Other than for visits with his lawyer and parents, he remained in this cell for 23 hours a day for three months until his case went to trial. If found guilty of murder, John would face the death penalty. The main evidence against John was his signed confession and despite the circumstances of how this confession was obtained, he was advised by his lawyer not to accuse a police officer of assault during the trial as he would not be believed and this would increase the likelihood of him being sentenced to death. John was shocked but hoped that if he kept telling the truth about how he had found Rosemary at the side of the road, the jury would believe him. The trial lasted six days before the nine men and three women of the jury retired to consider their verdict. Just two hours later, the foreman of the jury declared that they had found John not guilty of Rosemary's murder. The foreman was then asked for their verdict on the lesser charge of manslaughter by vehicle impact. Again, not guilty. Suddenly, the foreman called out, Wait, I made a mistake. Guilty. We found him guilty. The following day, 19-year-old John was sentenced to 10 years hard labour and was transferred to the maximum security Fremantle prison. John was given a job in the carpenter's shop where he worked every day. At 4.30pm, he would then be locked in his cell before lights out at 8 o'clock. He coped fairly well during the days, but found the evenings incredibly difficult, often pacing his cell for hours on end, thinking about what had happened to Rosemary and that the person responsible for her death was still free. On the advice of his lawyers, he did not appeal either his conviction or sentence as the lawyers believed that an appeal could go either way and then he could find himself convicted of willful murder and as such facing the death penalty. However, late in 1963, John became aware that the serial killer, Eric Edgar Cook, had confessed to Rosemary's murder. With this knowledge, John appealed his sentence. This appeal was heard in March 1964, where it was decided that Eric had invented the confession about Rosemary's murder in order to delay his execution, which was due to be carried out after his conviction for a different murder. As such, John's sentence for Rosemary's death was upheld. When the parole system was introduced in Australia in 1965, John was given a five-year minimum on his sentence. In order to be considered for parole, he needed to take responsibility for his crimes. 
who remained a perfectly behaved prisoner, took responsibility for Rosemary's death and was released on parole at the age of 26 after serving five and a half years in prison. Upon his release, he returned to live with his parents who, having spent all of their money on John's legal fees, had sold their house and now lived in a small flat above a shop. John became increasingly depressed and struggled to come to terms with his imprisonment and the fact that everyone believed that he had killed Rosemary. Shortly after his release, he became reacquainted with a friend by the name of Helen who believed in his innocence and the pair married in November 1968. They went on to have a son called Gregory in 1969 and a daughter Naomi in 1974. During this time, John's parents returned to live in England and when his mother became ill with cancer, John tried to visit but was unable to do so due to his criminal record. His mother, Lillian, died whilst he was waiting for an exemption to this travel restriction. Over the years, John suffered from severe depression and post-traumatic stress, which left him unable to work or support his family and also to him being hospitalised on multiple occasions. He self-published a book called Why Me Lord? This was about his ordeal and continued to campaign to clear his name. However, all of these attempts were unsuccessful. In 1992, John's brother, Jimmy, met with the Australian journalist Estelle Blackburn, who agreed to look into John's case. After six years of research, she published a book called Broken Lives in 1998, which looked at John's conviction and also that of Darrell Beamish, who had been convicted of murder in 1959. Again, Eric Cook had confessed to this murder but had not been believed. When Estelle's book was published, it won the Western Australian Premier's Literary Award in 1999 and then in 2001 she was awarded the Walkley Award for Most Outstanding Contribution to Journalism. This publicity brought John's case to the attention of the Attorney General who decided to refer the case to the Appeals Court. At the appeal, Trevor Condren, the police accident examiner in 1963, stated that he had examined John's car on the day after the accident and told the detectives at the time that he believed that the car had not hit anyone. He stated that there was no blood, hair, skin or fabric on the front of the car and that the damage directly matched that detailed in the police report about the accident John had with the Ford Prefect three weeks before Rosemary's death. He was however told that his findings were unnecessary as John had confessed to killing Rosemary. In addition, John's legal team for the appeal had flown the world's leading pedestrian accident expert, William Haight, to Australia and he had completed experiments with a biomedical human form dummy Simca sedan similar to the one owned by John Button and a 1962 Holden sedan similar to the one that Eric Cook had stolen and been driving on the night of Rosemary's death. From William Hayde's experiments he concluded that John's car could not have struck Rosemary with enough force to kill or even severely injure her but that the evidence supported Rosemary being hit by a 1962 Holden sedan exactly in the way that Eric Cook had described in his confession. Sally Cook, Eric's wife, also testified that her husband had confessed several times to deliberately running down Rosemary before his execution in October 1964. He told her details of how he had spotted Rosemary walking through the underpass, had then completed a U-turn before driving up behind the young woman and deliberately hitting her with his car. Eric had then driven about three kilometres away before driving the car into a tree to disguise the damage from the attack on Rosemary. The testimony of the owner of the stolen 1962 Holden also supported Eric's version of events and the conclusions made by William Haight. 39 years after Rosemary's death, on the 25th of February 2002, John's conviction was quashed by Western Australia's Court of Criminal Appeals. It became the longest time to elapse between a conviction. 
In a TV interview six months later, Rosemary's parents still maintained that they thought John was guilty. However, after discussions with the Director of Public Prosecutions and a group meeting with a restorative justice expert, they eventually accepted that John's innocence had been proven. Despite this, Rosemary's mother said that she would never be able to forgive John for taking her daughter out that night and never bringing her safely home. After finally clearing his name, John threw himself into helping others in similar situations by starting the Innocent Project in Perth, where law students at the Edith Cowan University would work on wrongful conviction cases. In 2003, 59 year old John was awarded 460,000 Australian dollars in compensation. This would be 695,000 Australian dollars today, or 538,000 US dollars, or approximately 392,000 pounds. At the time, this was the largest amount ever offered to a wrongly convicted person in Western Australia. However, it is viewed by many, including John and his family, as a painfully small amount considering the impact the prison sentence and criminal conviction has had on John's mental health and ability to work, together with the toll this has taken on his family. John later moved away from the Perth area to escape the notoriety that came from his case and has focused his retirement on spending time with his wife, children and five grandchildren. Please add any comments down below. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. I wonder what your view was on the award settlement, 460,000 Australian dollars. Make sure you leave your view in the comments.